on a brutal winter day during the Second World War. A locked box car crammed with Jewish prisoners is abandoned in the middle of nowhere. These prisoners are being transported to concentration camps destined for death or hard labor. Inside the box car, there is very little ventilation, no heating, and no toilets. Everybody is terrified. As the day becomes evening, the air becomes colder and colder, and people are moaning and crying in pain. A little girl in this compartment sees an old lady next to her, shivering uncontrollably in the cold. Something moves inside this little girl. She is filled with compassion. So she reaches out and starts rubbing the back of this older person, trying to keep her warm. And the evening becomes night. And slowly all the moaning and crying die out. And by midnight, it's deathly quiet. And still, this little girl c continues to rub the l back of the older lady, giving her hope through a hopeless night. In the morning, when soldiers come to open this box car, only two people are left alive. This old lady who received the warmth and the young girl who, in the process of providing warmth for the other, had inevitably warmed herself. Now, I don't know if this story is valid or where it is from, but as I think about it, two questions come up for me. The first, how is it possible for one member of a species to be so wantonly cruel to another? An alien coming to catalogue life on our planet would note that humans are a brilliantly creative but frightfully short-sighted species who squander every opportunity for peaceful coexistence. Intelligence is the ability to learn from mistakes. But if you look at our history, it would appear that humans are not that intelligent after all. <laughs> the same horrors that happened 80 years ago happened in the past and continues to happen today. Because if we were an intelligent species and if we learned from our mistakes, we would not be staring at the meltdown of our only irreplaceable planet. We would not be spending so much on wars and military budgets when a fraction of that can alleviate the suffering of most life on this planet. We would not be so dreadfully scared of each other and we would not be burning up our planet to escape to another. We seem to be really good at creating bigger and better tools every day only to use them to hack at the very roots of our survival. Is there hope for our planet? I sure do hope so. Which leads me to the second question from the story. This little girl, she herself was in a lot of pain and she had no idea how the next day was going to turn out. But still, she chose to help the other person. And I wonder why. I would like to believe that on that desperate afternoon, this little girl turned, looked into that older lady's eyes and saw a little bit of herself in the other. And as she did, a veil of separation fell away and compassion ensued. Compassion, the ability to notice suffering and seeking to alleviate it, happens because I see a part of me that is in you suffer. When my heart moves for you, an unfettered, fearless, eternal part of me is reaching out to that same part of me in you because it cannot bear to see a part of me suffer through you. To realize our interconnectedness is to realize compassion. At the quantum level, we are connected by a complexity so deep that the idea of separation seems meaningless. At the end of the day, we are simply consciousness being cycled through many bodies across many lifetimes. Albert Einstein noted that the idea of separation is an optical delusion of the consciousness, a kind of prison. And our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by expanding our circle of consciousness 
to include all living things and nature in all of its beauty. As a cancer scientist, I've been privileged to witness some of the extraordinary miracles of life firsthand through the microscope. Every cell is a masterpiece of divinity. Nationality, race, religion, all of these things seem meaningless when we have witnessed the miraculous machinations of cells firsthand through the microscope. And at that level, it is so easy for us to lose identities. And this idea of identities that we hold on to, it's a fickle thing. Take away a section of my brain and I'm no longer Emmanuel. One more section gone, I'm a vegetable. Take one more section out and I'm no longer alive. So who am I? I am 37 trillion cells, each cell with about 2 trillion molecules working in perfect harmony. And each of my cells is forever busy communicating with its neighbors, sending signals inward, creating and consuming energy, multiplying and dying in this perfect dance, so I can uniquely experience this magic called life. This is me, but this is also you. So what am I so afraid of in you that is stopping me from touching and healing that part of me in you? This is the realization of Ubuntu. I am because we are. Nelson Mandela points out that Ubuntu is that profound sense that we are human because of the humanity of others. We struggle, we strive, we overcome and we thrive together. If the illusion of separation is the cause of our suffering, then embracing our oneness is the foundation of compassion. And I would like to share with you an exercise that can help us break those veils of separation and embracing our oneness. This is the practice of metta or loving kindness and some of you probably practice it already. But I want to introduce it anyway. So the fun foundation of metta is that in spite of all of our differences, we all aspire for the same things, love, happiness, peace, purpose, the traditional practice of metta is like peeling out the layers of an onion. We start with ourselves and then in ever-expanding circles of love, we send out wishes of loving kindness. The beauty of this practice is that it can be as short or as elaborate as we want it to be. And I would like for us to try a metta practice right here, right now. So, I'm going to invite you to look around just look around and see somebody whose face you do not recognize, a stranger. And I want to give you a second to do that. Just look around, find a face that you do not recognize, a stranger. Now take a really good look at this person, kind of try to get their face in your mind. Yeah? And it's okay to smile. Okay. <laughs> So once you've had a good look at this person, I'm going to invite you to come back to your seats and you can close your eyes. And let's start with a deep breath to center our hearts. Now remember this person's face and realize that this person is somebody's daughter or son, somebody's father or mother, somebody's brother or sister. And like you, they are aspiring for the same things. Love, happiness, peace, purpose. So I invite you to join me in wishing this person these words of loving kindness in your heart. May you be free from danger and anxiety. May you find love in abundance. May you find happiness and peace in good measure. May you find your life's purpose. May your heart awaken to your true nature. And you can open your eyes. You are energy. I'm energy. Our wishes are energy. 
As we send out our wishes of loving kindness into this world, we change the pulse of this planet. And slowly and slowly the healing happens. And then we will stand shoulder to shoulder and stand up to the hate mongers and the war mongers and say, enough. We deserve peace. Our children need a future. And then, through compassion, we will learn not to repeat the mistakes of our past. <laughs>